Your Honor, is are you aware that this is our last witness for the morning? Could Keith tell you? I just heard that. So I think we'll have a long lunch, depending on how this one goes or how long it goes. Okay, but then what we should be thinking about if we're breaking early for lunch is maybe resuming early instead of at one or twelve thirty or something. I can certainly try. The, it's the medical examiner first this afternoon, so I can see whether she could come sooner. And, Your Honor, we did move one of our Thursday witnesses to this afternoon. So. Do you recall what time you got called that night? 
I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall whether it was night? Was it in the middle of the night or was it the next day? It was night, um, late, late night. Okay. And so did you, in, or when you get called out, do you go to the scene of where they're asking or do you go to the barracks? Um, I was requested to come directly to the barracks, so that's where I went. Okay. And so where is that? Uh, in Williston. Okay. And upon arrival at the barracks, did you see anybody that you knew? I did. Uh, so when I uh, pulled it, I, I had a, at the time I had a canine, so I normally park at a distance away from where everybody else parks. So he's not getting up every five seconds when somebody drives in the parking lot. And I had walked across the parking lot, and uh, I saw Officer Eric Shepard standing outside the entrance to. Uh, the dispatch center and you drink it out a plastic container of water. Okay. And you know you knew Officer Shepard before I did. that night? I, I know Officer Shepard, yes. And how long have you known Officer Shepard? Um, for as long as he's been a police officer I've known him. I don't know how long it's been. <coughs> Ten years. Okay. And was he acting did you interact with him? I did. I approached him. Um, can you describe his demeanor? He didn't seemed to recognize me at first, um, which wasn't that surprising because I was out of uniform. I mean, I, don't, I didn't wear a uniform at that time, uh, and I hadn't seen him in probably a couple of years. Um, so he didn't recognize me at first, but, um, and then he was pacing um, kind of back and forth in the, the same spot, and um, I had stopped um, you know, 10 feet from him, and he he walked over to me, and I thought it was odd that he, he got so close to me. So I backed up, and then I had asked him a couple of questions, and um, he, he was just babbling, he was just gibberish. It, it made no sense at all what he was saying to me. And I thought at first he was joking about something, and um, then I, I realized that he had actually been involved in the crash. And uh, then I asked him, I asked him what he was doing outside, and he didn't. He didn't seem to know why he was outside, and um, I had decided at that point I needed to escort him back inside the building and, and see if anybody else knew what was going on with him. But at that same time, uh, a vehicle had pulled into the Williston State Police uh, parking lot that I recognized as the Williston Chief's car, uh, and I just ushered Eric over to that car. Okay. And how did you determine that he had been involved in the crash? He was able to tell me that. Okay. And was he able to tell you anything else of substance? Objection, Your Honor. I'll take that back. Um, you withdraw? I will withdraw. Okay. We'll yeah. okay. Not really, no. Uh, oh, don't, you don't have to don't answer oh. it. Sorry. <laughs> um, have you ever observed Eric Shepard, Officer Eric Shepard, act like that before? No. Okay. And have you, in your 28 years of law enforcement, um, observed individuals exhibiting symptoms of shock? Yes, I have. And did you observe any of those symptoms in Officer Shepard? I did. Which of those symptoms did you attribute to um, shock? The pacing, the... Uh, the inability to communicate in any real form, um, and I had asked very pointed questions, and it, his responses were complete gibberish. Um, to this day, I don't know if he even knows that I talked to him that night. So. Okay. Was he able to focus on you, or no, did he not seem unfocused? He was. He he was drinking the water. He'd take a sip of the water, put the cap back on, take a sip of the water. But I mean, he. In a, in a one minute span, he probably opened and closed the water and took a sip 25 times. Okay, thank you. And at some point after this interaction with Officer Shepard, did your assignment change from doing witness interviews to something else? Yes, after um, I had been at the barracks, um, an hour, maybe close to two hours, my assignment changed from taking uh, statements. Okay. And why did it change? Um, 
the accidents, the severity of the accident was um, so extreme that at the scene, the, um, the fire department and the police officers that were there were uh, unable to decide how to remove the victim's bodies uh, from the car. Okay. And what, dis what decision was made about how best to do that? I had asked that um, the vehicle be brought to the state police office. Um, there was a, a lot in the back that I could do a controlled removal of the bodies uh, in a location that was uh, off the interstate um, with lighting. Okay. And so was it your opinion that the doing that removal at the scene was not in best practice? Yes. Okay. And so is that in fact what happened? It is. They were able to um, load the vehicle with the victims uh, still in it and transport it to the barracks in Wilson. Okay. And do you recall what type of car you were it, processing? It was a Volkswagen, um, small Jetta. Okay. And how many occupants were initially in the vehicle? Initially there were five, um, but there were only four victims when the vehicle arrived at the barracks. Okay. And what was your understanding of why that was? I understood that one of the victims had been ejected uh, at this, the scene of the collision itself. Okay. And of the five in the vehicle, how many of the occupants um, were deceased? All five had, had passed away. Okay. And so when the vehicle arrives at the police barracks, um, you were you doing the removal of the body um, bodies by yourself? Uh, no. So there was, uh, I think, I can't remember what his title was, but there was a uh, Williston Fire uh, fireman that was assisting. I had uh, an assistant medical examiner, Jamie Peach, and I also had a new trooper, um, Dan Kelly, that they were all assisting at that time. Okay. And so were you able, or as part of your practice in, well, I guess I should say, had you ever done something like that before? Um, I've removed uh, burn victims um, from scenes before, but I don't, I can't remember removing burn victims from cars. Okay. So did you uh, photograph your kind of process of yeah. how? Yeah, so the, the process was to photograph the vehicle before uh, we did any of the removal. Um, There's a fair amount of equipment that's required to uh, forensically remove and uh, label and package a victim. So all of that was prepared first and then the process of removing started, yes. Okay. And so did you, in fact, um, were you, in fact, able to remove all four of the bodies? Yes. Okay. And did you transport the bodies to the medical, or do you then transport the bodies to the medical examiner's office? Yes. So as part of my assignment to the medical examiner's office, uh, I was provided with a vehicle that um, was equipped to transport deceased people. What makes that vehicle different from a normal vehicle? I have gurneys, uh, backboards. Um, it's essentially uh, much like a, a hearse, uh, but it was a, a, a pickup truck that was set up to transport bodies. Okay. And did you take um, the bodies to the morgue individually? So I was able to take um, two at a time. Okay. Um, so I had to make two separate trips, but yes, I did transport all four victims to the medical examiner's office. Okay. And then did you attend the autopsies of all five of the individuals? Yes, I did. And were you able to identify the fifth individual who was ejected from the vehicle? Yes, she was uh, identified at the scene that night. Um, and how did she get to the... So she was transported by a funeral service that had been called uh, to the scene. That was, I, I believe I actually made that decision as well, um, okay. not to leave her there while we did the other processing <coughs> to have somebody come transport her. Okay. And were you ultimately able to identify the five occupants? 
Yes, all five were identified. Okay, and how did you, how were you able to identify them? Uh, so burn victims are generally identified through uh, two processes, um, dental records and uh, medical records. I believe all, all four of the uh, burn victims were identified through dental records, I believe. Uh, we had medical records, but I think ultimately it was dental records that identified all four of them. Okay, and then the fifth was identified, at least in part, by the ID that she had on That's her? That's correct. Okay. And um, who were the five identified as? So the driver was um, Cyrus, or Cyrus, I don't know how he says his name. Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus. And behind him uh, was Liam. And then um, Mary Harris was the center passenger that had been ejected. Eli was in the back seat, uh, back passenger side seat, and then in the front was uh, Jamie. Okay. And so Cyrus, is that Cyrus Shao? Yes. And Janie, is that Janie Kazi? That's correct. And Liam, is that Liam Hale? Yes. And you said Mary Harris, and Eli, is that Eli Brookins? Yes. Thank you. And who was the medical examiner? that conducted each of the five autopsies? Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bundock. Okay, thank you. That's all that I have, Your Honor. Any questions? No questions. You can step down, thank you. Okay, uh, can I see counsel? So um, we're told we have good news and bad news. Um, so uh, our next witness is not scheduled to come until uh, this afternoon, and it, we're going to try to get that witness here earlier than she was expected to be here. And um, we're going to try to have her here and ready to go at 12.30. Um, I guess it's part of the, there's, here's the good news. First of all, the attorneys tell me that we are ahead of schedule um, and the trial is moving along. Um, and um, uh, it's a beautiful day. So you're going to be able to break now and have a slightly extended lunch. But we would love to have you back here um, at 12.30 ready to go. And we'll try to be ready uh, to go as well. We're, we're good. We're good. Yes. 12:30 okay. More. So we're good to go at 12:30. So we'll have you back here, ready to go at 12:30. It is beautiful outside. So enjoy lunch. You know the admonition: no conversations with anyone, including each other, about the case. No conversations with anyone else you may come into contact with about the case. But just have a great lunch. Thank you. All right, please.